many of you know that I've done quite a bit of study on secret societies, uh, Freemasonry and, uh, and others, and there are many forms of it. And uh, they actually follow the same type of methodology, if you like. They're interested in drawing people in through a secret. And they're interested in revealing little bits and pieces of the secret to, you know, it's almost like leaving a trail of breadcrumbs to the real secret, that you have to follow the breadcrumbs and get deeper and deeper engulfed into that whole thing that they've got going. Um, and as you gain knowledge, you become, in Freemasonry and other secret societies, you become more enlightened. And they actually have different levels. Like you have a third degree Mason, and you have a 33 degree Mason. Now would it make sense to you that the 33rd degree Mason is more enlightened than the third degree Mason? And the, the, the third degree Mason doesn't know anything about all the initiations above them. Because they haven't gone through that path. But the 33 degree Mason, having traveled that path, would know all the things that a third degree Mason may not know. I guess it's kind of like, to use a poor analogy, if you're in grade 10, you know everything that grade three is going through. But if you're in grade three, you don't know what's still ahead of you to learn. Um, as they get up into these levels, uh, they are encouraged to meditate. And through meditation and, and the reading of secretive books that are given to them to gain enlightenment, to gain knowledge and to become enlightened ones. And I've, as they get higher in this, they become uh, an enlightened group of people that are above the non-enlightened. So if you or I are considered non-enlightened because we, will, we don't go through those initiations and we don't study those things, we are considered just regular fleshly people. But they go through a progression of enlightenment where they become, uh, through, through knowledge, they obtain a more Christ-like or a more God-like attribute. Because what they're taught is that the gaining of knowledge and enlightenment brings them closer to the Godhead. Does that sound familiar to you? Satan in the garden in Genesis 2.17 said, but the tree of the knowledge, well, I shouldn't say that Satan said this, but in the garden they were told, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So we know in the garden there was a tree, and the knowledge of it was a knowledge of good and evil. Not just good, but both. And this was something that Adam and Eve had never acquired. It was not for them. It was forbidden from them. And who was it that recommended to them that they should take and taste of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Try the fruit of it. Who, who asked them to do that? Satan. That was Satan himself. And what did he say they would become if they partook of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? As gods. They would become as gods. Now, you think that's the end of the story? It's the beginning. And, you know, I had no idea, but that thing is going out into the world on such a level, on such a scale, Today, and through the centuries, he has never stopped his doctrine. They say Satan goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Trust me, this is his method. 
through secrets, through the gaining of knowledge, so that ye shall become enlightened and as a God yourself. And I can tell you that in every non-Christian following, in every non-Christian or non-Jewish teaching, all the pantheistic teachings, that there is this enlightenment teaching that is going on, the teaching of the self. Ye yourselves shall become as gods. For example, Buddha. Who was Buddha? What would they call Buddha? He was called the Enlightened One, was he not? All right, he attained a level of knowledge and enlightenment. And the whole idea of reincarnation is going through these phases of enlightenment and become coming back again and again as different creatures until they finally become part of the great cosmic Christ or great cosmic God. Well, my Christ is not the cosmic spirit being. My Christ was a Christ who came in the flesh. And if I can't say he came in the flesh, then I am deceived by an antichrist. And my Christ died. My Christ is not some great unknown entity of light waiting for me at the end of the tunnel when I die. That's not my view. I'm going to read briefly to you about Gnosticism. You ever heard of the Gnostics? Or Gnosticism? Well, during when Jesus was present on the earth, there were actually those who were called Gnostics. And is, historically, they're often thought to be uh, Christians at the time. Um, let me read you a little bit about Gnosticism. The doctrine of Gnosticism is this. It's a doctrine of salvation by knowledge. That you can become saved through knowledge. That you can become enlightened and join the great enlightened God. Um, it's been around even before Jesus. And what it teaches is that the world was created by an evil God who was acting without proper authorization from the good God who was the secret and true God. The material world, for either reason above or some other reason, is therefore inherently evil and flawed. And Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden by the evil God for the sin of seeking knowledge or gnosis, thereby rendering the serpent into a heroic figure. So gnosis means secret knowledge. Gnosis is actually translated as secret knowledge. Gnosticism. Uh, the evil god is a male figure, sometimes referred to as Semel, which means blind god, or Yaldabaoth, which means born of chaos. And the good god is often depicted as a mother goddess. Jesus was an emissary of the good god or goddess who was sent to earth to impart secret knowledge to the chosen few. 